welcome to Grapple Arts Radio. Hello everyone, this is Stefan Kesting from GrappleArts.com. Today I've got one of my most influential instructors and my really good friend, Philip Jelina from Montreal, Canada, on the line. I'm so happy to be talking to you. How are you doing, Philip? I'm doing really well, Stefan. How are you? I'm very good. Now, one of the reasons I was first drawn to Philip when I met him was that not only was he really down to earth, but he's also super deprecating, which is why I, not you, are going to go through your, your list of achievements and the amount of certifications that you have for teaching martial arts, which is just incredible. The first martial art that you received your black belt in was a Japanese Kempo system. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And since then, you've become a ninth degree black belt in Kaju Kempo Karate. You're an instructor under Daniel Asanto in Jeet Kune Do, in Silat, in the Filipino martial arts. You're one of the highest ranking students of Pekiti Tersiakali, which is a Filipino martial arts system under Leo Gahe. I think you're certified in Muay Thai in a, by a couple of different organizations. You're one of the original Dog Brothers, the full contact stick fighting guys out of California. You're an instructor in that system. You're one of the top tier fighters. You're uh, a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You're an instructor in combat submission wrestling under Eric Paulson. And is that, is that more or less it? Have I missed anything major? I, I hope you haven't missed anything, but I don't okay. think you have. Okay. And well, and just a couple of days ago, you were inducted into the Black Belt Hall of Fame. So first of all, congratulations. That's an awesome achievement. Well, I thank you very much. How was that? How was the, uh, the actual induction ceremony or the abduction ceremony? <laughs> well, it was, it was very interesting because uh, I, you know, I, every time I think about these things, I kind of think about that thing that uh, Groucho Marx would write when, uh, or he actually said to somebody who, who was asking him if he would join a local country club, and he said, I don't want to become a member of any club that would have me as a member. And <laughs> I just sort of thought, well, you know, that's kind of what I feel, because, uh, you know, it's, it's, that's just, I don't know, I just can't, I don't, I'm not into that kind of stuff. So anyway, I kind of learned to absorb and accept it. It was really quite spectacular, uh, John Terrier, um, who, uh, besides being a high-ranking jiu-jitsu black belt, was also uh, Jean-Yves Terrio, uh, uh, the Iceman's manager for many years, or still is, um, was uh, organizing this thing in Ottawa this past weekend, and it was amazing. There were about a 1,000 participants uh, who came to the dinner. Um, it was really quite spectacular. There are only eight people who ever get uh, inducted every year, so... I thought to myself, well, how on earth did I fall through the cracks and get elected? And it was really kind of surprising. The real question is, how did you avoid getting abducted for so long? Well, it turns out this thing has only been going on for a few years. And uh, the people uh, would come up to me and say, oh, wow, I've, I've been trying to get you in here for a long time. And I go, and it'd be, it just was hard for me to imagine that that was true because, uh, you know, we just we have we keep a pretty low profile. And even though we do things. Uh, we, we we think we do things at a pretty decent level. Just because you do something at a decent level doesn't mean you're going to get any kind of uh, public uh, acknowledgement of that. So you don't do it for that reason. You do it because you're looking to be the best you can be in what you're looking to do, and nothing, you know, the other part. If you start worrying about, you know, if people like you or how many, you know, how big a thing you're going to win if you go to a tournament on a Saturday, then you're going to you know, invariably find yourself depressed because I won a bunch of those tournaments in the past and eventually I left all of those trophies on the side of the road because, you know, tin and plastic doesn't really make an awful lot of uh, memories that last. And mm -hmm. it's the memories that are more important than that stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and, and your legacy with your students, of which you've had thousands and thousands over the years, you've certainly got one of the, the premier schools in Eastern Canada and, and certainly in Montreal, um, anybody, you've met just about anybody who's anybody. And, you know, you've had an awful lot of big names train with you over the years. Oh, yeah, it's actually been kind of uh, surprising. And when I, when I, you know, I, I was funny because when you get them, when they're training, you don't really relate to the fact that, oh, such and such is here. Or, oh, wow, that person over there, they're really well known for doing this. Uh, because you just get to the point where you start realizing that, they are just human beings. I think one of the things that helped me uh, in the 70s, 
I was uh, involved with some people from high high school, and uh, one of them got involved in rock and roll touring, and I was working for a local promoter, and then I went on the road for a few years from uh, 1977 till about 1981, and it was actually kind of funny because, um, I mean, my first tour I ever went on was with Black Sabbath. And in those days, I mean, it's kind of funny because Black Sabbath is now really cool. Everybody wants to know what it was like to train, you know, like to hang out with Black Sabbath. In those days, you didn't actually say that to anybody because, you know, if you were what you considered a, you know, a mainstream music listener, you would, you know, you were listening to Eric Clapton, you were listening to, you know, Jimi Hendrix, and it was kind of like Black Sabbath was kind of like that stuff that, you know, nobody ever listened to and never made it to any radio stations. And so, you know, I mean, they were great guys, but, you know, you weren't going to go and say, wow, you know, I'm on tour with Black Sabbath. You were, you know, you're going, wow, yeah. What are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm on tour. What? Who with? Oh, we're at, we're playing at the Palladium. Oh, <laughs> what, what band? Uh, we are tonight at eight o'clock. And, you know, so, and then the people say, you're going and what are you doing? Well, we're, I'm on tour with Black Sabbath. And, you know, so it, it, I know it was snobbery. It was kind of reverse snobbery. But nowadays it's really funny because, you know, my son thinks it's the greatest thing in the world that I worked with them. You know, and uh, you know, it's kind of amusing because, you know, in those days it was kind of like, wow, yeah, these guys, I mean, they there was a brilliant thing. I mean, uh, Black Sabbath in those days were, you know, they, they were managed by a very, very smart guy and he was able to uh, get them on the road. But, uh, you know, in you know, when you see what rock and roll is like nowadays you go wow these guys were you know they were they were doing it the right way it, it wasn't wasn't bad at all but anyway as a result of seeing these guys and seeing all the people they were with you got to see an awful lot of things that uh, you know martial arts martial arts are the same way I mean, they're people who do things really well and they just happen to be raised in the vision of uh, somebody you know somebody decides that this guy over here is really great and Gosh, I wish I was like him, and I wish I knew him really well. And you realize that, well, that may be true, but you know, above and beyond anything else, there are people who, if they want to get better or stay good, they've got to practice. And I had a, a facility where they would come and they would train. And so, uh, as a result, I got to know a few of them. You know, I won't say really well, but well enough that they would remember me if they walked me down, walked past me on the street. Would you be referring to George St. Pierre, David Loiseau, Patrick Cote, and those other MMA yeah, fighters? Yeah, well, in Montreal, I mean, when I mean when when George started uh, training with uh, at our school, I mean George George was really good. He uh, you know he but he was primarily a Kyokushin fighter, uh, and he was working with his friend Christophe Midou, and uh, who was also a, a Kyokushin fighter, but he was from France, and he really in stimulated George to uh, do some stuff, and. Uh, then uh, when I hired uh, one of the first black belts in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to, who came to Montreal and started training, well, George came by because they were looking to get their Jiu-Jitsu better. And uh, so Christophe and George and uh, then eventually all the other guys came down to the school. And uh, eventually George got his blue belt from uh, from Vagny through the Novinhao group. And then uh, things just went on from there. And George was with us for quite a while. And then when he left uh, – after uh, Vagney left, and we got another Brazilian black belt in, um, and then George came back and was with us for a while, and then you know, it, but it was the, the same thing. I mean, like you know, when you have a lot of people who are advising you, which is talking in your ear and trying to get you what to do what they think you should do, as opposed to somebody else thinks you should do, uh, you eventually get uh, pe- you know things happen. And so uh, George left. He he left us and. Um, then he got his, you know, he left us and got his brown belt from someone else, and then he came back and trained with us for a while, and then he left us again and he got his black belt, and and you know he hasn't uh, trained at our school uh, since that time. Mm-hmm. And you haven't toured with Black Sabbath in the recent in the recent no, past either. And, and I, I just I don't know where I've been. I've been waiting for that phone call to come, but they just <laughs> haven't haven't bothered calling. So oh, I'll put a good word in for you. So <laughs> Thanks. so then this this would have been an interesting. A stage in George's career because he had already been fighting at this point, but he was, I, I wouldn't say was the complete fighter yet that he is now. Well, actually, you know, it's, you know, the, if you look at the way George's uh, techniques worked, the, the, the most definitive work that we did on his stuff, I mean, he, in the beginning when he was working with Wagner, uh, he was basically learning just the ins and outs. I mean, like you know, the side control, the arm bar, uh, 
the rear naked choke. It's just a standard uh, lexicon of terms that you have to learn if you're going to do it. When he came back to us again, what he was able to do is because he already had done pretty well as far as learning how to do those those basic techniques, and then he started doing, uh, you know, uh, the people started getting better. I mean, at the beginning, it was, you know, when you saw Hoist in the UFC, it was just like, you know, was, is he going to do a choke or is he going to do an arm bar? I mean, there was mm-hmm. not much choice. You know, you, this was going to happen to you or that. And then mm-hmm. people got better, and then all of a sudden, he couldn't do those things to you. And so now it became somebody would grab your arm and maybe we would try to do an omoplata instead of something else, or maybe they'd go and do this instead of something else. And so uh, when uh, we were teaching George specific counters to specific techniques, and I would say that uh, the stuff he learned in those days seems to have been what has stuck with him. I mean, he may be training with other people now, but uh, the top game that he has uh, had its early formations uh, at our school. Okay. Well, that's that's really interesting. I, and when you refer to Hoyce, I mean, not to take anything away from the man, but that really was the triumph of technique over athleticism. And and now we're dealing with fighters like, you know, John Jones, George St. Pierre, who are not only very, very technical, but also super athletes. You know, they would do well in, in other sports as well. Well, I think that's, um, but that's the thing about it. That's, I think, one of the reasons. I mean, we all say that, yeah, that's... Um, that's something that's come about, but I mean, when when Art Davies and uh, Horan Gracie first put together the idea of this, it was based on uh, the what was happening in Brazil up to that time. I mean, they had the Vale Tudo fighting, and I mean, all these guys were fighting in Brazil, and it was kind of wild and crazy. But you know, to appeal to the American audience, which is what it was all about with the UFC, you had to really give them something different. And you had to, you know, they, of course, he had Hicks and Gracie, who was a, also a great MMA fighter and great jiu-jitsu fighter. But if you put him up against all these guys and he won, everybody would go, yeah, but look at him. Look at him. This guy is really buff. He's built. He's like an awesome yeah. fighter. Of course he's going to win. I mean, there's no big surprise. He would have won anyway, even if he was just a soccer player. So by putting Hoyce in his kimono, a tall, you know, not gangly, but definitely not, you know, not packed with, uh, you know, uh, all those muscles that all the other guys had, um, and he was still able to take all of them down and basically submit them all one after the other, and um, as a result, you know, successfully defend the title that uh, you know Brazilian Jiu Jitsu saw for itself. And we have to realize that up to that time, you know, the Gracies had some standing t- uh, challenges in the Los Angeles area where they had their schools that they would take on anybody at any time, and uh, you know that that was successful at getting them some action pretty, but you know pretty badass. To break in say again pretty badass yeah with well, pretty badass and you know they you can still get uh, an awful lot of those uh, videotapes where you know somebody would go in there and you know there'd be some guy and you know i mean there were a lot of really really well-known karate guys who uh you know took the challenge and uh you know found themselves wanting and uh mm-hmm. i was actually very fortunate because i mean i was I was listening to that, and I had the same things of the other other guys. You know, say, oh yeah, well, you know, uh, and you know, of course, we all had this idea that yes, given the opportunity, we could win. Little realizing that what the Gracies did was, and they they'd come up with uh, this plan, this technique that, and it was based on you know, fighting people who were trying to fight them, and they came up with this idea of how to make this stuff work. And there was nobody at that time who had a really, really good plan to counter it. And so for the first two UFCs, these guys were awesome. And they were just like, nobody could beat them. But by the fourth and fifth, I mean, by that time, you know, the the other guys uh, were starting, you know, it's not like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu got crushed to the dust. But, you know, there was no longer that kind of one-sided superiority. I mean, the learning curve was really steep, but it was acquired. I mean, American fighters went from being like, huh, what's happening? You know, the you know, the wrestlers would you know, would not want to go to their backs and now went to their backs. The guys who the guys who would do stuff, the strikers learned how to strike. I mean, I remember Demetrius uh Evan I was Edwards no Demetrius Edwards, um the kickboxer had his uh you know, he was the first guy that actually started successfully doing it. Then the wrestlers started bringing the ground and pound and I mean these are certain aspects that um, had never been thought of before. And mm-hmm. these guys uh, 
change the face. I mean, yes, the the wrestlers were able to bring you know come in and do the clinch game, but they substantially changed the game. Even though, had it not been for the wrestling or not the wrestling, had it not been for the jujitsu, the situation never would have been a, a discussed point. But uh, you know now you know now strikers can strike a mat. You know they can strike and they can have a striking fight. But if you don't, if they didn't have any grappling to speak of, they would be taken down at will by somebody who knew. So uh-huh. it was a you know it was, it was a really really brilliant move on their part. They they were able to bring their art to North America and they were able to get it well known in a really really quick period of time. And I mean look at them now. I mean, uh-huh. You know they if you want to see uh, you know. Successful martial arts uh, companies. You look at a Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, factory, if you'll excuse that pun, because they're they're turning people out, you know, left, right, and center, and they're they're getting the better athletes, and they're going in, and you know, the, you can have you know, kind of lazy fighters, and you can have you know, great athletic fighters, but you know, they they have tournaments, and you know, they they're they're they do well, and you know, if you go back to Brazil, I mean, they've got a very successful judo team. That has that have competed in uh, world and uh, Olympic events, and most of those guys have had a lot of experience in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu on the ground. So there must be some connective tissue that seems to be working. Mm-hmm. Well, one one of the things that I was really looking forward to talking to you about is actually not really related to MMA competition per se, and that's with the Kajukembo that I trained with you for years. It was very much a self-defense system. And when people talk about the other martial arts, most of the other martial arts that you do, say the Filipino martial arts, the Kali, the Silat, again, people think of them mostly as self-defense systems, right? Right. And and the tendency now is to look at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as kind of a niche sport that has some influence on MMA. But what about the connection between Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and, I guess, submission grappling in general with self-defense? How do you how do you see that connection of the ground and the stand up self defense for somebody who's never planning to step into a ring or step into an octagon, but still wants to be able to you know handle stuff when when stuff goes badly in the street? Well, I guess the one thing that I mean, we all try to put situations into the contextual reference points that seem to suit ourselves better, and so now you have uh, you know when if you were to look. At the historical background, I mean, the the self defense aspects of Gracie Jiu Jitsu has always been there. I remember attending the first seminar that uh, Horion and Hoyce gave in Montreal back in I could have been eighty four, eighty five. I don't remember exactly when. There were about three hundred people in a, the floor of a boxing school. I mean, the 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 promoters had to borrow mats from everybody, my school included, because there was just so much floor space and so many people wanted it, and they were. They taught, you know, over a day, they taught like four techniques, you know, one technique of you put your hand on the floor and then Mm -hmm. you step your foot back and you leave your other hand forward and you're not allowed putting, you know, or you have to stand up without putting your hand on the floor. And it was an arm bar and something almost nothing, uh, almost nothing involved. And you just go, wow, this is a, you know, they're not going to teach very much. And I guess they plan to have like a 20 year plan to learn to teach jujitsu. And then everybody else, of course, started teaching it everywhere. You know, I remember seeing uh, some tapes and there were some guys going, you know, there's more than four times as many techniques as taught by those other guys, you know, so it was like that. But I think what happened is that the the self-defense was always a very strong part. I mean, the stories you hear about uh, the bridge, uh, not the bridge, but the beaches in uh, Rio de Janeiro when you go to the coast, you know the Copacabana breach of bridges. You know it's like or beaches. You know whenever there would be a fight between a jiu-jitsu guy and somebody else, there'd be a like a scrum. Everybody would be going around and screaming, you know, jiu-jitsu ju- or whatever it was going to be that luta livre and all those things. And so the self-defense thing was always part of it because it was always fighting. I mean they, you know, they would fight in tournaments and that would be kind of like the recreation. But you know. <laughs> The stories I've heard from most of these guys is that they fought all the time. Enemies was sometimes 30 guys against 30 guys. Sometimes it was one guy against 10 guys. So uh, a lot of times, you know, the well, well, what people are finding out now, you know, the, this idea that you know you are going to go to the ground and start choking somebody out. Part of it, I think, is that uh, you know these guys literally learned how not to go to the ground. I mean, like you know when. If you were fighting 10 guys and, you know, you you got a choice. Okay, I could break one arm or choke one guy out and then I'm on my back. 
I have this dead weight on top of me or something, and all of his friends are using me as soccer practice. And, uh, you know, quite honestly, you know, Americans kind of don't realize this, but, uh, uh, you know, in other countries other than those in North America, you know, kicking with feet is a very natural, almost instinctive reaction because that's their major sport and that's what they do all the time. And so I, I hear those Brazilians are pretty head, good at soccer. Head, you know, this head is a soccer ball. You know, they're probably less inclined to do it because, you know, whenever they've had the chance, you know, to win every one of the ten instead of the one, I'm sure they're just as, you know, trying to score that goal just as easily as anybody else. And so I guess, you know, what's happened now is that – People, you know, in, in a fighting thing, if you're a jiu-jitsu guy, of course you want to grab the guy and you want to pull him to the ground and put him in your guard or get on top of him and choke him out or do whatever it is you're going to do. But, no, you know, I mean, a lot of these guys are fighters and have been fighters since they were four years old. And I'm not talking about fighters in jiu-jitsu. They were in fighters and street fights. And so they, they know that that's not what you do. You know, and, and but, of course, if you're marketing something, you're not going to market it to say, this is going to work really great except for – you know, so you're going to tell everybody this works all the time, and you know, even though you may not always do it, you're going to say that it works because it's it's a smart thing to do. But you know, nowadays, of course, everybody goes, ah, "There's no way that would work," and you know, they would bring up, you know, how could you use jujitsu against an atom bomb? That's ridiculous. <laughs> but you know, it, it, but uh, you know, it's not going to stop people from saying, "Yes, our jujitsu works even against atom bombs." You know, so mm -hmm. it's it's uh, it's the same kind of marketing. It's just. It's you know if you insist on something, you know they, I'm sure there are enough people out there that will believe it. I mean you know look at look at look at some of the stuff people buy on the internet for goodness sakes. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean you started out this conversation by saying that people always create scenarios that make themselves that present themselves or their abilities in the best light, mm -hmm. and so I mean the com the combatives people who who learn a bunch of super deadly killing techniques but never actually try it try it out on anybody, are always talking about this hypothetical street that's, you know, full of syringes and broken glass, and, uh, you know, there's always a multi-person attack scenario, and oh, by the way, the guy has, you know, HIV and AIDS and leprosy and Ebola, you know, I, you know, I live, in a, I live in a city that's got a fair IV drug use problem, there's a lot of drug users around. I actually don't see syringes on the sidewalk every day. And if it did go to the ground, you know, I think you've got more pressing concerns than worrying about, you know, a piece of broken glass. I think your adrenaline will take care of that. Not to say that you should go there, but if you do end up there, God, you, you do need to have some kind of a plan. Well, I think that's, a, that's exactly it. I mean, like, the, your situation, I mean, a lot of people go to the ground in spite of whatever you're thinking about. I mean, like you, you know, all of that stuff, you don't want necessarily go to the ground, but let's say, you know, you're, you're walking somewhere and you trip. And so you find yourself on the ground. And so what are you going to do? Say, Hey, just a second, let me up. This isn't fair. We should fight fair. I mean, of course, no one's going to ever say that. They're just going to, they're going to take, you know, they're going to be like a pack of hyenas. If they think that they can get you, they will get you. But just the same way. I mean, like, even though you know on these nature shows we always see we always see these uh you know either the moose or the deer and there's some pack of wolves or some lions and they're always attacking and it's always much more spectacular to see the lions you know taking the gazelle down by the neck and you know and all these little you know little lion cubs eating and you know or whatever they do but i would probably say that there you know if there were if this was true that this happened every time there wouldn't be any gazelles because they'd all be dead, right? Because they're all stupid and they all get caught every time they get attacked, which is not true. So, you know, most lions, you know, spend an awful lot of time trying to hunt. Why? Because they're not that successful. And the same thing with this. I mean, I, I remember watching a, a show and they said, you know, the, the uh, great white shark looks at a seal as 30,000 calories. And maybe they only have 5,000 calories of energy that they can use in trying to catch the seal. So they're basically trying to trade up for more calories. And, you know, sometimes they don't succeed. And so mm -hmm. the, that's the thing. There's, you know, the, the seals are there. And maybe we'll look at them as people are, you know, walking down the street. So even though that there are tons and tons of people who, you know, that there's, we always look at that and say, okay, well, you know, this is going to happen. But as you say, you know, if, if somebody attacks me, I'd say the biggest problem people have when it comes to being attacked is the 
you know, this stupidity we all seem to manifest when we, we all kind of have this de idea. It's like most people can avoid problems just by looking around them. And so, yes, you may run into this, but I mean, most people I know that are, you know, that have been in some kind of street fight, if they've had any kind of training, they have used that training to their advantage. If they're, you know, they're, but, you know, most people, you know, just look and say, okay, well, you know, I've been doing this martial art, you know, fill in the blanks, doesn't matter which one, for a long time, and I should be able to handle this. I mean, I remember reading a, 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 karate, a karate magazine years ago, and somebody was talking about Mike Tyson and how, you know, he should be easily taken care of. I, after all, I am a shodan, and I, I know that seven <laughs> pounds of pressure will break your knees, so... As a showdown, I'll easily stop Mike Tyson with a sidekick to the knee and stop him dead in the tracks. Good luck with that. Yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. So there's that. And then there's the people who go, you know, I mean, a lot of smart people, you know, and most of the philosophies are like, you just walk away. I mean, but it's only people who, you know, who think that they, you know, they have to defend their honor, whatever the heck that is. Uh, But, you know, there's that old uh, adage that we use. Is a catch gimbal adage, right? Uh, it's not who's right, it's who's left. Well, mm-hmm. there's a that's that is you know, or better to fight and run away than live to fight another day. There's all these little things that we think are very funny. Now, I think that uh, you know, when it comes down to it, if if I'm being attacked by two or three guys and I slip, then I'll probably try to get to my feet. Uh, in you know, in the stuff that uh, we do, there's an awful lot of the self defensey things that tell us, yeah, this is what you have to do if you go to the ground. And you stay there, well, you're probably going to be used as a soccer ball. But, you know, the most time I've ever seen is like, you know, even people people who are just grapplers, when it comes to two or three people, they're swinging for the fences. They're not they're not trying to do arm bars and chokes there, you know, or if they're doing an arm bar, it's just to hold the guy in front of them so they can, that will be the person that they hit instead of, instead of the guy who they're trying to hit. So the it's a tough it's a tough call because you you want to be able to say yes my technique will work in all situations but you know the the reason that a style or a system is created is because it's referencing a particular situation a particular set of circumstances I mean you know I mean look at the Maginot line it was a brilliant idea as long as it was applied in the First World War but since it wasn't it didn't really mm-hmm. work very well afterwards because the techniques and the tactics changed. But, you know, I mean, a lot of martial arts are kind of like Maginot lines. So that, yeah, well, this, this, you know, well, you know, we always hearken back that, well, you know, back in the 18th century, you know, the, the attack method was there. So we're developing a technique perpetually based on the attacks of this person to this person, you know, in, in the battlefield of, uh, you know, Eastern Prussia. And they go, well, that's nice, but it's not necessarily valid today. And I think that that's a, that's a real situation that we have to deal with so that, you know, of course, the jiu-jitsu guys would probably say, yes, you should go to the ground. And the other guy who's actually on the ground is going, no, we should get up and I should run away or I should do something else. And so things uh, things are fluid and they are liquid and they change. So if we take MMA as a martial art, I, mean, I know it's, <laughs> there's no martial art called MMA, but there's, there's a certain convergence there of techniques and okay. strategies. How applicable in your mind is training MMA to self-defense? Would you oh, recommend gosh, it, it to somebody it, who wants to get better at self-defense? I would say it's very, very good. I mean, why? Because the first thing, the first rule of self-defense, I mean, if you were to uh, use any of those Bruce Lee analogies, is physical conditioning. I mean, one of the things that he found when uh, there was in that, mag- that article, I mean, I never met the man, so everything I'm doing is just paraphrasing what people have told me about this, but he supposedly fought somebody, uh, and uh, that person he beat, but he didn't beat them in the, in the style to which he thought he could have, and he realized the reason for that was because he was physically out of shape, and that's a big problem in that if you don't have the conditioning, you are going to probably lose that fight because it doesn't matter what you know technically if you don't have the ability to execute it, you're not going to do it. You know, I mean, like if you think you can wrestle. And you try to wrestle one of the things we have a wrestling class at our school, and one of the things you realize is that the people who are out of shape don 't do so great i mean they do they do really well for the first thirty seconds, but if the other guy 's got any skills well you got some you 're going to have a long evening well in m m a one of the things i mean you run, you spar, you do things, you wrestle, you do jiu jitsu you strike, you use all those muscles in the ways that they need to be used 
And uh, quite honestly, those ways are very, very, uh, how can I say, they're, they're demanding of your body. You know, mm-hmm. you may be able to sidekick, you may be able to round kick, you may be able to knee, you may be able to do a single leg, a double leg, a high crotch, use all those things and pick ankle, pick the guy and, you know, do a side control and a top guy, you know, a mount and do all those things. But if you don't have it, if you don't have whatever it takes to go more than a minute or two, you're going to, you know, your, your energy is just going to die and you're going to be sort of like, you know, it's like hold, trying to hold your breath underwater. Yeah, you know, you may even be good at this. I can hold it for 30 seconds, 35 seconds. After a certain point, the air in your lungs starts becoming non-oxygenated anymore and you start struggling because then you start realizing that you're now fighting against not only the fact that the person's fighting you, but you're fighting against the fact that you don't have any more oxygen. So those guys in MMA fights are, for the most part, in much better shape than the people they're going to run into. So as a self-defense, that's probably one of the better ones I can imagine. Mm-hmm. The, uh, as you were talking there, I was just something, I just recalled something, and I don't wonder if you've seen this. There was a clip on YouTube a while ago of this dude who was going out to pick a fight with his neighbor, uh, it was some kind of parking dispute, if I remember correctly. So he set up the camera, goes outside, and the next thing you know, his neighbor picks up a shovel and hits him with the shovel. And he spends the next five minutes beating on the guy who's on the ground with the shovel. And you would think that that would kill whoever was on the ground, because, I mean, it was just a you know, couple skinny guys. But the guy on the bottom was laying on his back and picking off the shovel shots with his feet. I don't know if he'd been trained or if this was just instinctive or if he thought like better that he hits the bottom of my feet than the top of my head with that heavy metal object and he survived you know because of essentially the guard and i i wish i could find this clip if somebody listening to this can find it uh you know shoot me an email and i'll put it in this interview because it was kind of such a fascinating application of of uh you know you can't use jujitsu you can't use the guard what if there's weapons well this is exactly (laughs) a case where uh to save this guy's ass against uh, against a weapon. Have you seen this clip? No, I haven't seen it. But it sounds it, I didn't realize that there there was a, such a perfect illustration of what I was talking about. But yeah, mm. uh, but the thing is that if the, but if the guy was really tired, you know, he eventually would have not been able to hold his leg up to stop the guy. Mm-hmm. So uh, mm-hmm. I think probably in that case, both guys. One guy's getting tired of swinging the shovel. The other guy's <laughs> getting tired of. <laughs> yeah, thanks. But so then, where do you? If we're just talking from a self-defense context, and we're talking about grappling, whether that's no-gi grappling or, or uh, gi grappling, what about the weapons aspect? Because I know you as a dog brother, actually, I'll uh, segue into this first, or I'll use this as an introduction first. You are a dog brother, and what that means to people who don't know is there's a bunch of crazy Californians who are training in the Filipino martial arts who decided to start testing what they knew in full contact stick fight. So it's a heavy rattan stick, a fencing helmet, hockey gloves, elbow pads, a cup, and not much else. And fairly quickly, from what I recall, they started blending. They, a lot of them were training with the machados at the time. Was that right? Yes, and they started actually, blending the, the, the standing with the uh, ground. The, I met, I met uh, through Mark Denny, who is uh, the crafty dog. Um, he's the uh, guiding force of the Dog Brothers. That's what they, you know, instead of calling chief executive officer, I guess the guiding force is his name. Anyway, he um, introduced me to uh, Higgin Machado. Uh, he actually did it surreptitiously. He said, oh, I have a private lesson. Would you like to come by? And I was there with my wife, and he said, oh, sure. sure let's go by and see this Brazilian jiu-jitsu stuff. We'd all heard about it, but, of course, hadn't seen anything up close and didn't know and mark had been was the first person to actually have been uh, introduced to this outside of uh, the group and so he uh, invited me over and i met uh, hagen machado and it was like oh yeah and then about half an hour mark decided that well uh, really what uh, you know i'm getting tired i'm like philip why don't you take the last half of the private lesson so i went okay i'll do that and uh, i went over there and i uh I got turned into a pretzel. My wife thought it was hilarious to see me, and she took <laughs> photographs of me being twisted around in things I now recognize as being Uma Platas and you know uh, different things. But in those days, it was I didn't really know what they were. I didn't have a, a frame of reference. I hadn't, didn't really start training 
uh, in a grappling system at that time, and definitely not Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because, I mean, it was available in Los Angeles and maybe Brazil, but it wasn't really available anywhere else. And so, as a result, there was a, a you know, there was less chance of me ever running into it. But you know, Mark wanted me to see, and he actually wanted me to see if I could bring the Machados up to uh, Montreal, and I, I tried. And it's, but you know, of course, I mean, now it's very funny because if you know this area, we have so much Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with you know, what they say you can't swing a stick without hitting a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner now. But in back in 1992. Uh, the the most familiar refrain is ah oh, we already have that because of course you're not you can't tell them about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because you don't know what Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is you're just telling them wow this guy turned me into a pretzel and I couldn't stop him and he's really good and you know which you know they go everybody goes just because you suck doesn't mean we suck too you know that don't you <laughs> and so of course you're I mean, and and of course having no frame of reference you're going I guess you're right and anyway so. Uh, Nobody was interested in having him up here, and that that was combined with the uh, the general Brazilian uh, ability to never answer a phone call if necessary. Uh, you know, you'd call them and they'd never call you back, and they'd never call you back. And then two years later, they'd say, "Why didn't you ever call me? Hey man, what's wrong with you? Eh? You were supposed to call me, and you never call. Anyway, so that uh, we, as a result, we uh, we never got them up here until. Uh, you know the, the uh, 90 after the uh, UFC in 94 and then of course the uh, the long trip began and uh, we didn't get a brazilian black belt here we had some brazilian blue belts who who uh, not brazilian blue belts but br- blue belts of brazilian jiu jitsu had come up here but uh was the first time was 98 that we actually got something so it was like maybe about 8 or 9 years after the initial contact had been made but uh yeah it was a uh, well, can, kind of can you but talk a little bit about how the how grappling is different when there's a stick or a knife involved. Well, it was like anything. I mean, like uh, okay, the grappling happens. I mean, that's uh, you know, if you're hitting with somebody with a stick, everybody goes. You know, people say grappling doesn't happen. I said, look, if you're boxing, grappling happens. You may not wrestle to the floor, but when you have two boxers and when they get tired, you know what? They hang on to each other. You know what that's called? Grappling. Because you're not allowed to do it, they don't actually give it a real name because then you'd have to give rules and you'd have to say, well, you're allowed or you're not allowed. But you're grappling. You know, you're know, you holding on to a guy. You hold on to his arm so he can't punch you. You you rabbit punch him in the kidney so he can't punch you. Again. You, know, you know, you punch him in the back of the head or whatever, and the referee stops you. But really, you know, it, it enables you to get a little bit of a rest. And so people do it all the time. I mean, it's not foreign to – you know, I would say – you would very, very hard put to find a boxer who has not done that kind of grappling in his career at some point in time. Mm-hmm. So uh, what they, when you get to a stick, it's the same thing. So you're isolating the hand that has the weapon, be it a knife, be it a stick, be it a sword. And, and people go, yeah, but you know, in a real fight, this would happen. And you go, most of these people who say that have never been in a real fight with a weapon. You know, they can say what they want. I mean, sure, you can get really close to somebody, and if they've got the knife and they're really pulling you closely and they're, you know, inserting the knife into various organs, of course, your argument is going to sound very true. Oh, you shouldn't do this. But if, you know, if you have two people with longer weapons and, you know, I mean, the biggest, you know, the most dangerous place for you in, when, a, when somebody has a long weapon is at the end of that weapon. I mean, you either need to go farther away or a lot closer. And a lot closer seems to be a lot smarter sometimes, especially when running is exhausting. And so people would get really close. And, you know, it doesn't take much. All you have to do is do a little bit of historical study and see that, the, you know, the grappling stuff, uh, you know, has existed in medieval stuff and in Japanese stuff. And, I mean, you know, what is jujitsu created for? I mean, what, if the samurais always had these beautiful katanas with them, why were, you know, why did the <laughs> jujitsu exist? Well, because maybe it didn't exist all the time. And people say, oh, well, it's only because they didn't want to spill blood on the emperor's lawn. They said, look, the emperor didn't have guests all the time. We're trying to kill each other. You know, this jujitsu existed in spite of that. And, you know, there have been, and all sorts of things existed in spite of that. And, you know, the idea that somehow, you know, there was some kind of code of honor about this. And like, yeah, sure, there was a code of honor. You know, like, you know, I do it until I get caught. And then I say, oh, no, I'm too honorable. You know, so that's a... Uh, same thing, you know, when it comes to stuff like that. I mean, if you have a weapon, it'll happen, and so you can charge in, you know. And uh, and another thing is that, you know, the one thing is that, you know, people can say what they want, but you know, bladed weapons have a tendency of getting dull. 
Now, for the most part, you can cut things. You know, if you sit on somebody's face with a sword, you're probably going to cut it. But this idea, like when you hear the people, you know, uh, somebody get, you know, you hear or see, or see a razor going, and you know that's the sound it makes as it slices open your thigh. Okay, but I mean, you know, in the 70s we used to have uh, a lot of doormen that were training with us in various things, and I'd hear stories about people, and, and you know, this one guy was, you know, at some after hours club, and you know, he, this guy would, we wouldn't let him in, and he was, you know, and the guy attacked him, and. You know, he didn't really feel anything. The guy sliced him twice with a razor, and he didn't, you know, he, when he moved, he felt his thighs all wet. And that's only the reason he knew, because they, it didn't really, it's not like, uh, or when people, you hear people getting you know, into a fight, and somebody, you know, like, you know, I was doing some stuff, and he kept punching me in the ribs. And it turned out later, he wasn't getting punched, he was getting stabbed. But somehow the grapple still happened. So to say that, you know, make ridiculous statements that, oh, that doesn't happen, it's based on, you know, wishful thinking because it's sure as heck not based on, on, doc, on documented fact because that's just not true. And certainly the Dog Brothers have developed specific chokes or attacks to do. I'm more familiar with the stick end of things, but, you know, I've, I've ended a, I, I'm not a Dog Brother, but I have done full contact stick fighting. And, you know, certainly the Fang choke has ended a fair number of matches. That's a, that's a one vicious attack. And there's a whole bunch of other chokes and arm locks and manipulations that you can do with a stick. It, it really complicates the grappling game, which is good if you know what's going on and bad if you've never seen it before. Well, I mean, as you were saying, the, you know, the, the thing about it, okay, now, uh, I know you've been, you've had a, a really, you know, I mean, like, your the successes you've had in, in jiu-jitsu competition are based as much sometimes on your desire to illustrate uh, certain points. I remember you telling me that you were once uh, at a tournament and you were trying to illustrate a particular, ex um, you, you had created a lesson plan for something on video and you wanted to have some things in the tournament that you would il use to illustrate it. And so you were trying to not win a fight, but you know, illustrate this uh, technique and see how it was taught and how it was fought. And so you were running into tr trouble having with somebody who wasn't going along with your plan. Well, the reality is, for me anyway, that, you know, the, w the one thing about, you know, for example, as you get better at, you know, executing arm bars, you also get better at stopping people from executing arm bars on you. So that's the thing. So if somebody's trying to do, like when somebody comes at you, I mean, you've got it, somebody comes around and they put their hand around your neck and they start driving into your neck with a, you know, with, with a butt into their stick and then it's really uncomfortable and so you tap out. Well, a little while later you're actually getting pretty good at this. I mean, the, the stopping of it. So you learn how to relax a bit. I mean, somebody has your arm, your arm in an arm bar. Well, I mean, uh, you see people and they're able to stop you. They're able to stop themselves from getting hurt by these things. And because the things that hurt are you stiffening up and going, oh no, it's not, you know. So, mm -hmm. so if you can relax and be soft enough, you can actually stop people from doing it. And the little micro adjustments to... Uh yeah, you well, you, you can change things, enough. and so you know, and knife is no different. I mean, like, we, you know, what's the difference between you know, if we were, you were a fencer, for example, you know, like, I mean, most of these things are like tick, 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 bang, and one guy gets a score. But you know, these are weapons that would not last in a battlefield situation. I mean, it's great. You know, you have this uh, five ounce, um, you know, a pay or something like that, and say, like, great. So you know, as long as the other guy has a weapon and you're, you know, everything's working electronically, you know, we we know that this guy won this match, and yeah, he got stabbed, but. You know, if you have a, you know, if you're both fighting with rapiers and it's a, you know, it's on the battlefield or in some situation where, you know, more people are there and somebody's got this big thing and they swing at you and you use your rapier to stop and all of a sudden your rapier is no longer a rapier, it's kind of like a, you know, maybe a long dagger. And so that becomes a problem. So you, you know, the, the, the weapons don't often last, you know, mm -hmm. the same way that bullets will misfire inside guns and explode and destroy the gun or they'll jam and so you can't fire or you'll get sand in your weapon and this and all sorts of stuff your your blade will you'll snap and you know I mean one of the big things when it came to uh, the Dutch knew how to hit uh, the the Indonesian weapons at the uh, at the tang and so they would break the things and so yeah you know, great you know people you know people don't realize that when you, you know, I mean, we all have these weapons that have come up, you know, and blade weapons must have been really horrendous at one time. And 
people figure out how to defend against them. You know, when you know, in the days when we had just muskets, we thought, wow, you know, just imagine when bullets were invented. Like, wow, you can shoot right away. Uh-huh. You don't have to spend a minute reloading. And then, you know, you said more bullets and went to near Gatling guns. And my God, this is going to destroy everybody. And now you have, you know, all sorts of you have electrically fired guns and people adapt. So same thing. So if you never fought anybody. Uh, you know, in a grappling situation with a weapon, you will probably find yourself getting your ass handed to you the first time if you fought somebody because you don't have that experience. And then, I mean, look at now. I mean, imagine, imagine if any of the mediocre, not even the good ones, the mediocre fighters fought. The you know, if you take one guy who who maybe one has like a five and five record in the UFC, and put him back in the original UFC, how do you think he's going to do? Oh, he's going to. At the very least, make it to the finals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why? Because he is the co- sum total of all that experience from all of those time periods, and not mm-hmm. just uh, you know he's not just saying, oh, you know, I think maybe I can do this. It's like no, he's they've you know nowadays they've managed to create this strange synthesis of attacking, and they've they've created ways from that attack into takedowns. I mean, I remember one of the things that amazed me with uh, seeing Hoyt. He had that, you know, kind of like that weird, like flip floppy type of stance, you know, almost kind of leaning back and your hands uh-huh. high in the air in this thing. And then he would do this kind of weird sidekick. And it was so weird as a technique that the guys would uh, look at it in kind of incredulous, like, oh, like, what the heck was that? And all of a sudden, this sidekick would turn into some ridiculous a technique all of a sudden bang they would grab them he was like run in glom himself onto them and then they kind of eventually pull himself pull the guy down so that he was on the ground so either he'd pull the person down on top of them or pull him to the side and then after that point he would because he had you know such great endurance he would just slowly fight his way back to the top and then the guy would either be arm barred or choked or something would happen but uh-huh. you know that's that was the way it happened in those days, and then people figured out what not to do, and they figured out what not to give, and they were figured out how to get away, and people adapted, and you know within you know the the fighting now changes. So getting back to the original question, you know what about you know MMA? Well, MMA is probably the most adapted fighting system today because it had to deal with that many. You know, it wasn't like well we're going to add you know tickling today. So no, no, it was basically anything went, you know. And there's, I mean, nowadays there's of course five pages of rules at the UFC, and originally there was nothing. You know, you could poke a guy in the eyes, you could kick him in the groin, you could grab him, pull his hair. They don't do that anymore. But even then, I mean, like most of that kind of stuff would just anger uh, most of the modern MMA fighters. I mean, uh-huh. if somebody pulled, if somebody was there, and you tried pulling their hair, you would, uh, you know, probably, you know, if the guy. You know, you know, the guy would probably get really angry and try to kill you. So, mm-hmm. you, know, would, you know, the sportiveness of it had been gone out. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm just, as you're talking about the uh, uh, the bladed um, confrontations, I remember the very first Indonesian Silat VHS tape instructional that I ever watched. Yeah, remember the VHS tapes? I think it was Herman Suwanda, but I could be wrong. It uh, It started with this guy with a knife and a guy without a knife. And uh, I was like, oh, okay, it's going to be knife defense technique. So the guy with the knife, who I think was Herman Sawanda, comes in and stabs the guy without the knife, and he he defends by grabbing the knife holder's wrist, at which point it turns out this isn't actually a video about uh, defending yourself against a knife. This is a video of what to do when you've got a knife and you're trying to stab somebody and they have the audacity to try and stop you by grabbing you. You know, here's all the different ways that you can free yourself from the grappling situation and, <laughs> and turn it back into basically assassination or murder, which just goes to show there's an entirely different mentality. But they do acknowledge that, this, that these kind of tie-ups can happen. And I, I'm, I would hazard a guess that these kind of tie-ups happen way more often nowadays than they would have 10, 15 years ago when... You know, you and I are going to have a fight. Okay, we'll stand back, and it'll be your sidekick against my, you know, reverse punch. The uh, so 
as technology changes, you have to know, you have to expect that almost, that, you know, you have to expect the clinch. And if you're not sparring, okay, so you're a super deadly knife fighter. You're a deadly, 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 deadly knife fighter, but now you're in a clinch. That's fine. If, you're, if all you want to ever do is knife, fill your boots. But for the love of God, make sure that you're doing some sparring on the ground with that knife, I, I think. I think that it's an awful lot of fun to, to uh, see people wrestling around and then throw a, a rubber or an aluminum knife on the mat and, uh, and tell them that that's now in play. That really changes the, uh, the grappling match. But what it doesn't change is the training method, which is still uh, competitive, where you're trying to do something to someone and they're really trying to stop you. So we're kind of using the training method from Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu there, which is contested, you know, constrained and contested competition. But now we're adding some of the, quote, you know, combative elements into it. But we're still sparring it as opposed to learning technique number one, deadly killing technique number two, and so on. Well, I, I think that's the, I think the, the, the very fact that in Jiu-Jitsu you're doing the one thing, you know, like your like first thing you're trying to do is clinch onto somebody as hard as you can and, you know, control them to make them do something stupid and then hopefully take advantage of that thing when they do that thing stupid or, or you hope somebody grabs onto you incorrectly so you can base out and, you know, counter that and, and find yourself in a more advantageous position. But, I mean, you're getting back to the stick fighting, the, the, the one thing that uh, Mark has been working on lately is this, he's been taking all of these things he's been doing and he's been working on something uh, they call die less often, the DLO stuff, so that they try to use some logical techniques, some, you know, some trainable things and make them work so that people will be able to use them in a, in a real situation. Because that's, that's always the problem with you know, a, a sporty type of thing. Because the sport thing becomes the the aim, the training of the sport becomes the aim, and the application in personal ability to execute against a number of variables stops becoming as important. I mean, your your ability to, uh, you know, your ability to do a jumping flying armbar is more important than your ability to stop a guy from punching you in the head. So uh -huh. you go, wow, okay, I can do that. Okay, that's great. You can do that. You can you can do a jumping flying armbar. You probably will never need that in a self-defense situation, but you know, in a jiu-jitsu tournament, that's a pretty good thing to have because if somebody happens to be susceptible, you don't have to worry. So if you do your jumping armbar and the guy steps back and falls on the mat, that's all that's happened. He's not going to go over to the side of the, of the mat, grab that folding chair, and try to hit you with it. He's going to sit there and you know, you know, he's going to have to. Whatever he's going to do has to be within the context of the rules. And so that becomes a, you know, like, okay, well, but the guy who's trying the, the jumping arm bar, well, you know, he's a physically fit young person. So he's, he's going to get that, you know, he's going to find out whether or not that works. And maybe, maybe it's going to work and maybe it's not, you know, so, I mean, I look, I, I remember how judo changed uh, when Eastern Europeans started getting into it. That flying arm bar thing actually uh -huh. was uh, an advent, it was a uh, created and not created, but it, it was starting to be used by the, um, I think it was Sambo the East crowd. Germans. Yeah. The Eastern Germans, it, used, East Germans using it because they, they were, they were able to, you know, that there were all these techniques that had been, you know, basically started, not started, but, you know, judo had started, but, you know, they, the, you know, if you wanted to fight the, 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 uh, the Japanese on their turf, you couldn't do it. You couldn't just be a poor imitation of a Japanese fighter because they had all of that stuff down. It's it's the way you had to do the new stuff. I mean, what it must have been like for the Brazilians to fight, you know, uh, BJ Penn. It must have been like really crazy because, I mean, of course, they figured that they had, you know, they were like the Canadians when it came to hockey. You know, when they first fought the Russians, it was like, what do they think they are doing playing hockey with us? So you know, <laughs> then all of a sudden, poof, you know, hey guess what? I have a plan and the plan seems to be working. So, Hey, let's go. So when it comes to stuff like that, there's a, there's that. So, you know, when it comes down to, you know, the dog brothers, you know, the one reality is that, you know, that people are now able to do things uh, that they couldn't do before. And the reason is because if you know what you have to look forward to, you're not going to be spending any time wasting your time worrying about that stuff. 
you're going to know that, okay, if he grabs my legs, this is what I have to do. I'm either going to be successful or not successful, but this is what I have to do. If he grabs my chest and back, this is what I have to do. I can't say, you know, the big problem most people have is like, oh, my God, he's grabbing something. What do I do? I mean, if you have no plan, if you don't have a sense of what you're supposed to do, I mean, the one thing that the, the UFC guys know is like, you know, the guys who strike. I mean, Chuck Liddell was never known for, for being much of a grappler. I mean, he was known as a great grappler. He was a good wrestler in, in college, but he, he never really fought as a grappling fighter. He was a striker. But because of his grappling ability, his ability to stop people from grappling with him, well, then he was able to use his striking ability uh, you know, until it stopped working for him. His uh, striking ability was quite amazing. You know? And I remember you know, those fights against Tito Ortiz. Tito would try to take him down, and he stuffed those takedowns, and then he would nail him. And as a result, you know, you know, Tito looked like he was you – know, on paper, Tito looked like the, he was going to be the winner. And I remember when – you know. Uh, Tito and uh, Chuck Liddell fought. It was kind of like, yeah, these are the training partners. But I, you know, it was kind of like you realized after a while that it was it was probably because you know Tito didn't want to get put into a box any more than anybody else did. Or I mean, uh, Chuck Liddell didn't want to be put into a box. And, like you know, he didn't want to be you know categorized as a you know here's my sidekick. You know, well no, I think you know he, he felt that he could win, and uh, he evidenced by that. I think he won a couple of times. So it was uh-huh. uh, it was a smart thing to do, but. A lot of these guys, you know, good grapplers, uh, you know, can use their grappling by just not grappling, you know, by stopping the other person. Good stick fighters, they can use their grappling by doing that. I mean, like one of the one of the things about uh, stick fighting that a lot of people don't realize, uh, and uh, you know, some of the smarter people who are fighting and learning how to do stick grapple, are, is that. You know, grappling with a stick isn't just grappling with a stick. It's not like jujitsu with a stick. It's like the the reality is that you have a, uh, an up to thirty inch extended lever in your hand that doesn't act as an, another phalange or another uh, another joint in your arm. It it can it can detach, which is a very effective thing. It has no pain threshold to speak of, so it can be pushed and pulled and prodded. And, you know, it has a, a certain, I mean, like, for example, if you are at six feet in the air and you awkwardly fall on your arm, you can dislocate a shoulder or break an elbow or something like that. If your stick falls from six feet, it hits the ground, bounces, falls over, and you can pick it up again and use it. So it, had, it doesn't have any of the negatives other than the fact that, you know, somebody who can grab it out of your hand and throw it away but you know, if you're not inclined to let that happen, you can use it, and it's a very effective tool. But like uh-huh. anything else, I mean, you know, the old joke of like, you know, to a hammer everything looks like a nail. Well, that's the problem with, uh, you know, with with thinking that you can use the the stick all the time. But you should, you know, you should be able to uh, understandably use the thing effectively. You can use it once you start learning what leverage points there are. You can use that to effectively uh, create a value added effect. I mean, you could, you know, you, for example, I've, I've got a technique with a, like an, uh, like a Kimura, like the, uh, I guess what, a, you know, what's called the, the chicken wing. Uh, they, you, you can use the stick in that le- and not put yourself in a position where, you know, for example, if you want to do a Kimura, you grab the wrist and you got to step over your arm and basically you're turning your back to your partner for that or for your opponent uh-huh. for that moment. But if you use a stick in the same regard, you position your your wrist, you know, push, push the stick on, on the inside on top of the wrist and then pull, you have a really good lever and you're not out of position. So you have a lot of things you can do that are better than uh, what's available just by your arms. But, you know, it's like anything. You can't just say, well, that's what I'll do any more than you can say, well, I'll just do that sidekick to time to Mike Tyson's knee and then he'll just fall down. So, well, no, you actually have to practice. You have to train it enough. You have to uh, be there. The, somebody proposed something once about uh, recently about that on one of the uh, websites. And they're basically like, you know, they always talk about stick grappling, but when is it going to happen? Well, I basically wrote that it'll happen the same time that anything else happened. You have somebody who believes in its execution enough that they will do that 
in spite of somebody else's desire to stop them. They'll believe in it more, and they'll do it more, and then eventually their learning curve will get to the point where they'll start succeeding more often than they fail. And then you'll see people going, wow, this works. Because if you know if Hoyas had failed the first time, then the UFC would have you know, would never have had this. It never would have gone where it is now. Because uh-huh. it's only reason in my mind that the UFC was there is because it just defied everybody's perception of what was going to happen. And so yeah. then it, then it kind of had a chance to grow. But had the Hoyas lost, you know, had someone like a Tank Abbott or you know one of those enormous guys won, everybody would have said, "See, I knew that big yeah. guy was going to win. What did you expect?" It was the fact that it was a completely unexpected uh, <laughs> ending that made everybody go, what? And so, and, and we'd all be power lifters now. Yeah, And beer exactly. drinkers. Because we all know that it's the best way to fight. Yeah. Well, on that note, um, we're going we're gonna to wrap this interview up. Okay. So, Philip, if people want to train with you, either in the context of seminars or uh, at your school, uh, the Gelina Academy of Martial Arts in Montreal. What's the best way to get a hold of you? Well, uh, we have a uh, an email address, Montreal Martial Arts at yahoo.ca, or they can call us. Uh, we're in the phone book, but it's uh, for those who don't have a phone book, it's five one four two eight one nine nine two eight, and we're open seven days a week. MontrealMartialArts.com. That's correct. Okay. Well. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this chat. I don't think we uh, followed any single idea in a linear, in a linear <laughs> fashion, but uh, I really enjoyed it, so I'm hoping other people enjoy it as well. Well, thank you very much for uh, asking me on. I, I've enjoyed it immensely. Have a great night. You too. Thank you very much.